Well, if you get to stay with me in big church, that's a few of you. We're working our way here at Crawford Baptist Church in our Sunday morning worship gatherings through the book of Genesis. And we find ourselves this morning in Genesis chapter 17. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 17. If you do not have one, there should be one in the seat rack in front of you. We encourage you to get a copy of the Bible and follow along. This, this morning will mean a lot more to you if you have the Word of God in front of you because, honestly, I have nothing to say to you that would affect you in any way if it's not anchored to the text. That's one thing about pastors. We can't be overly creative because if we do, we slip into heresy. Amen? We have to be true to the book. And so this morning, Genesis chapter 17 is our text. And, and yes, we're going to go ahead and look at this chapter today. But it's, it's much more significant than you may think at the initial reading. But I want you to remain seated. I'm going to read Genesis 17. We're going to come back and unpack some truths that really are significant for each of us in this room this morning. So you follow along in your copy of the Bible, Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Here comes that transition. I've been saying Abram since Genesis chapter 11. And now today we're shifting to Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He is broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. 
When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Let's pray together one more time. And fathers, we come to your holy word. This is a challenging chapter. But it's a very crucial, significant chapter. And so, Father, we pray for your help today to unpack the truths of your word in a way that would speak to our hearts, to our lives. And so, God, we commit this time to you. I pray that you would open our eyes and our minds to understand the truth of your word and to be transformed forever through this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'll keep those Bibles open, we're going to follow back through Genesis 17 as we work through this morning. Let me say this. Genesis chapter 17 is a significant story in the history of Christianity and the church. Genesis 17 helps us understand how God has worked historically uh, to bring about the redemption of his people. Genesis 17 also shows us how God takes the initiative in his saving work despite the weakness of our faith. Abram, although a man of faith, struggled with believing the promise of God. If you look back across the page to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6 for just a moment, it was back in Genesis chapter 15. That was two weeks ago in our series Genesis 15, 6, the text says, And he, that's Abram, believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So God saved Abram back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. God declared him righteous, not on the basis of anything that he did, but on, the, on the, that future finished work of the Messiah. Abram believed what the Lord was saying to him in his word, and based on faith, God accounted righteousness to Abram. That's a huge doctrine in the Christian faith. So Abram had been justified in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. But just like you and me, he had some days where he struggled to believe the Lord's promises. And so Abram struggled. And after all, he's been waiting now for 24 years. The Lord has spoken to him back in Genesis chapter 12. It's been around 24 years of waiting, listen, for a son and for some land. And right now, he has neither. 24 years. That's longer than some of you have been alive. Abram had been waiting for the Lord to fulfill the promise he had given him way back in Genesis chapter 12. Now, in Genesis 16, we saw this last week, Sarai came up with a plan, remember, to, hey, hey, I've got a a handmaid I acquired down in Egypt when we went down there and disobeyed the Lord. I, I, I have a handmaid named Hagar. Why don't you, based on the culture of the day, take Hagar as one of your wives and see if y'all can have a child, and then that child will be claimed by me to be my child, and then that child will be the son of promise. That was Genesis chapter 16. That was last Sunday. And and what happened there was uh, Abram and Hagar were able to conceive, and Hagar bore a son. His name was Ishmael, which means God listens. That's what Ishmael means. God hears. There's been conflict between the Arab peoples and, and the Jewish people from that day to this day. You see, God had it under control, but Abram and Sarai tried to help out God through their impatience, and then the result was Ishmael. And here's the point. Ishmael's not the son of promise. He's not. 
And so that takes us in then to our chapter for today. And I want to give you three big truths. And if you're taking notes today, and I hope you do, because when you take notes, it's, it's easier to study this later on. It's easy to remember things better when you take notes. Uh, and so in Genesis chapter 17, there are three big truths I want to lay out before you. And truth number one is this. Truth number one is this. God reveals himself. God reveals himself. And you'll see that. Look in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. Do you see Lord there? Do y'all see that? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. See that in your Bible? Lord, that is Yahweh. And Yahweh is the name for God that speaks of God being the eternal, faithful, covenant-keeping God. He's the God who gives His Word and He sticks to His Word and He always comes through. Listen, the Lord Yahweh, Yahweh is the eternal, faithful, covenant-keeping God who never lies, who never comes up short, who always delivers what He promises to you and me. And so the Lord reveals Himself. God reveals Himself to Abram here as the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. All caps is Yahweh in the Old Testament, the eternal, faithful, covenant-keeping God. And notice it. So I, the Lord appeared to Abram. So He appeared before Abram, and then He spoke. I am God Almighty. Do you see that? That in Hebrew is that famous designation for God, El Shaddai. And El Shaddai speaks of the Almighty God. It points to God's power. It points to God's sovereignty. That very name means God is all-powerful. It means that God is sovereign. You know, uh, my little daughter who was up here uh, singing and, and has gone to children's church, Mary Grace used to love to, to do this and say, okay, now, uh, all right, look at my muscles. And she'd do this little face and she'd do that. Like... And then she'd have you push, right, on her, her little hands to try to push them down. And she'd be holding them as hard as she could, showing you how strong she is. And then she'd say, okay, Dad, try it again. And she'd do, and then she'd let him go down. All right, El Shaddai never goes down. Even if it's a dad playing with his son or daughter, El Shaddai is all-powerful, listen, all the time. There's never a time when El Shaddai is not El Shaddai. And by the way, this is the first mention of God as El Shaddai in the Pentateuch. In the Bible, the first Pentateuch means first five books of the Bible. This is the first mention of El Shaddai in the Pentateuch. And this name describes the God who makes things happen by means of his majestic power and might. And I cannot help but when I read El Shaddai, God Almighty, thinking of my little daughter and that face and her holding up those hands. But our God cannot be overwhelmed by any circumstances. Let that encourage you and me this morning. Basically what God is telling Abram is this. God is saying, Abram, I am able to fulfill the awesome promises that I have set before you of a people and of a land. There's no need to let go of the promise because of your old age. Yes, you're 99 years old right now. Romans chapter 4 said his body is as good as dead, meaning he's now beyond the point of having children. That's what Paul means in Romans chapter 4. But the Lord is saying here, there's no need to let go of the promise because of your old age. There's no need to scale down the promise to match your puny thoughts. No need to resort to fleshly expedience, which he tried in chapter 16. No need of trying to fulfill the promise of your own scheming, which he tried in chapter 16. What God Almighty is saying is this. Everything, all of your life, All of your future lies in this, Abram. I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. And Christian in this room this morning, if you have been born again, if you are a Christ follower in the room this morning, listen, the same is true for you and for me. The same is true for you and me. And me. See, the way you live is determined by what you think about God. Did you know that? There's a beautiful A.W. Tozer quote. 
It's like the first line in the knowledge of the holy by A.W. Tozer. And Tozer says this in the quotes up on the screen. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let that flow. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You see, if our God is El Shaddai, if our God is El Shaddai, then our lives will be lived out of the fullness of God's promises to us. Amen? See, any thoughts of a God less powerful than the God of Abram will shrink your soul and neutralize your faith. Are you hearing me? And here's the deal, y'all. We've all been there. I mean, Abram was justified in 15.6, and he struggled at times to believe the ultimate promise of God. And there's some in this room, and you struggle right now with your salvation. Am I really saved or am I not really saved? Uh, am I filled with the Spirit or am I not filled with the Spirit? Is God going to come through? Am I going to actually graduate college? Am I actually going to find that man, find that woman to marry one day? Is God going to be true to his promise? Listen, Lord, I have, I, you have saved me, God. You have saved me. You have delivered me. You have ransomed me. You've adopted me into your own family. I, I, I'm, I'm trying hard. I'm, I'm having that God time daily. You know, I'm praying. I'm singing. I'm worshiping. I'm trying to lead people to faith in Christ. And man, my business is struggling. And I can't seem to find a godly guy or a godly girl to even go out with, let alone, you know, get engaged to and marry. I mean, I started out, Lord, looking for, you know, Brad Pitt in the body of a, you know, Billy Graham in the body of a Brad Pitt. I'll get it right. I'm looking for a Billy Graham in the body of a Brad Pitt. And then I changed my requirements there and uh, I started just looking for a, a guy that went to church. Now I'll settle if the guy can spell church. I'll settle for him, you know. Can I, can I... Can I still trust the promise of God? And the answer is, is yes, because if we don't look at God as El Shaddai, then our faith will be neutralized and our souls will shrink. And in Genesis chapter 17, not only does he say, hey, uh, I am God Almighty, he says this, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And, and you need to understand Walk before me means we're in a relationship, Abram. I've already initiated it. I sovereignly came and called you into myself. I have declared you righteous. Now walk in that relationship with me. Live as if you were one of my children. Be blameless. That's what God is saying to Abram. And look in verse 3. It's awesome. Then Abram fell on his face. You done that lately? You say, yeah, I slipped one in the calf last week. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about have you been on your face before God? That's what Abram's doing. Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Notice this. The sovereign Lord affirms his covenant with Abram and then changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Abram, by the way, y'all, means exalted father. It doesn't reference the patriarch at all. It, it references God, who is the father of the people that he's in covenant with. So Abram refor, re, re, points us to the exalted father, God. But now this exalted father changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. And notice that he says here, Abraham, you will be exceedingly fruitful. Doesn't that sound good? That means lots of kids. You're going to be exceedingly fruitful. You know, I, I can see him, you know, sitting there at the post office. Or some of you re relate to this, sitting in the mall. 
maybe walking, getting exercise laps in, but you're sitting there in the mall, and somebody said, man, man uh, what's your name, bud? Abraham. And, of course, the Hebrew is going to know, okay, Abraham, that means father of, of, of many peoples, father of a multitude. Said, well, how many children you got, Abraham? None. The name doesn't quite fit Abraham at this point. He's been waiting for 24 years. But you see, God is revealing himself to Abram as his sovereign Lord who has the authority to change his name from Abram to Abraham. Abraham, you will be exceedingly fruitful. You're going to have a lot of children. More than the stars in the nighttime. Do you remember that in 15, Abe? Ab? We've already been through this discussion many times in your life. I have given you my word. Yes, I haven't chosen to fulfill it yet, but I have given you my word. Keep walking with me. My plan will be fulfilled and realized in your life. You're going to be exceedingly fruitful. God will make Abraham fruitful, a father to nations and a father of kings. In fact, five times, if you underline them as I did studying this week, five times God says, I will in these verses. Five times, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring. I will give to you and to your offspring this land, the land of Canaan. I will be their God. I'm going to be your children's God, Abraham. Five times there in those few verses, God says, I will do this. I want you to understand, God is revealing himself to Abram, to Abraham now. And to you and me through the pages of inspired word. Amen. If you got it, say I got it. God reveals himself. Amen. I want you to say that on three with me. Ready? One, two, three. God reveals himself. He's doing it to you this morning. You're here at Friends Day 2018, Crawford Baptist Church, 3000 Sun Valley Drive, right? And God's revealing himself to you. No burning bush. We don't want these things to catch on fire. All right. No burning bush, but we have a burning book that's powerful, and it's alive, and it's active, and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And God is speaking to you. He's Lord, sovereign Lord, faithful, eternal, covenant-keeping God. And He is God Almighty, El Shaddai, for you and for me. Point number two. Point number two in our text is this. God declares His covenant. God declares His covenant. So God reveals Himself. Number two, God declares His covenant. This is verses 7 through 14. Look in verse 7 again. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So what we see here in verses 7 through 8, God is declaring this covenant. Hey, Abraham, I will give you an offspring, and I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. God promises to be their God. But then in verses 9 through 14, God gives us the sign of the covenant. God gives us the sign of the covenant. And now that children's church has gone to children's church, we can get down to business. All right? So hold on to your seat. All right, verse 9. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. And this is my covenant, which you shall keep. Between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of covenant of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my Covenant. And so the sign of the Abrahamic covenant is the word circumcision. It is the process of circumcision. Now you need to understand circumcision, the Lord did not invent this process at this time when he's talking now to Abraham. 
The Egyptians, for example, had been doing circumcision for centuries. There was a different type of circumcision, and it meant something completely different to the Egyptian people. But here in Genesis chapter 17, God kind of gives us a new meaning for circumcision. And this is what I came up with. Listen to it. Circumcision was a sign throughout the descendants of Abraham that God made a covenant with the patriarch. He made a covenant with Abraham. And this covenant happens to have lasting benefits for the people there with Abraham, but also for all the peoples of the world. And this covenant links Abraham, right, with the life of the future promised Messiah. That's what this circumcision means here in Genesis chapter 17. And circumcision came to mean and came to symbolize the spiritual commitment of one's life to God. When you circumcise that little male baby boy on the eighth day after he was born, that signified externally yielding his life and giving him to the Lord. It's it's one's commitment of one's life to God. Actually, the parents obviously have to do this, right? The external symbol signified a whole life commitment to the Lord. Circumcision also, if you'll think about it, involved Abraham's powers of procreation, which is, from last chapter, the very area of his life where he had messed up. Because he took Hagar, his wife, Sarai's handmaid, and he took her as his wife, and then he and Hagar uh, went together, and they ended up having a child whose name was Ishmael. And, of course, listen to me, that failed. Here's a life application principle. Man's best plans and strength of will will never bring about the son of promise. I'll say it again. Man's best plans and strength of will will never bring about the son of promise. God promised Abram a son and some land. In Genesis 12. And he has repeatedly reaffirmed that promise, that covenant with Abraham throughout chapters 12 now into 17. And you know why? Because Abram is just like you and me. Abraham is just like you and me. Your spiritual life is probably up and then it's down. It's up and then it's down. You're up on the mountain, but the God on the mountain is still the God what? In the valley. Some of you know that song, right? Old Southern Gospel song. The God in, on the mountain is still God in the valley. And that's our life. We're up and we're down. That, that's Abram's life, Abraham's life. That's Sarah's life. That's David's life. That's Solomon's life. It's Isaiah's life, Jeremiah's life, Micah's life, Nahum's life. It's Peter's life. It's James and John's lives. It's the Apostle Paul's life. Read Romans 7. It's your life. You see, we're a lot like Abram, Abraham. We struggle at those moments. And, and so Abraham tried to help out God in that process back in Gen- Genesis 16. And it failed to bring about the son of promise. So circumcision is a reminder Also, that covenants are solemnized through blood. Covenants are solemnized through blood. Circumcision inflicts blood and pain upon the one who is circumcised. And here's the thing. Every Hebrew male from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Moses to David... To Jesus, every Hebrew male on the eighth day was circumcised. They underwent that operation. And so circumcision is a huge symbol of covenant with God for the Hebrew people. But here's what it ultimately points to. You need to catch this before we go to point three. Okay? We need to catch this. That physical circumcision was the sign to these people that reminded them of their need for a new heart and a new mind 
which can only come by God's grace. You see, physical circumcision reminded them that they needed, listen, a circumcision of the heart. Now you say, Pastor Jay, I I didn't see that in the text. Well, if you hold your place in Genesis 17, flip over in your Bible just a moment to Romans chapter 2. Would you go to Romans, New Testament? God gave us fingers so we can turn pages in the Bible. Amen. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verses 28 and 29. This is too good not to see. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. You want to see this. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Y'all still with me? Now, every Jewish male on the eighth day after birth was what? Circumcised. It's okay. We're in church. You can say that word. It's okay. It's all right. I know you probably don't hear it in church much, but it's, it's the Bible. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Now, that's where the Jews had arrived by Jesus' day. Hey, man, we're the children of Abraham, and we ain't believing in you. Well, Jesus basically comes along and says, hey, if you're really children of Abraham, you will believe in me. I mean, I'm the one fulfilling everything that Abraham talked about. And that, you know, like the whole, you know, the, the, what you call the Bible, the script, Holy Scriptures. Hey, they're all about me. It's, you know, I didn't come up with this thing when, when I say the Bible is a hymn book. It's all about him. I didn't come up with that. Listen, Jesus revealed that to us. Luke chapter 24, man, everything written in the law and the prophets and the writings are about whom? Me. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, this book is a hymn book. It's about Jesus. And so, look back at Romans 2.28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Huh? Come again? We went through that. And circumcision is not outward and physical? I mean, it's like one of them, what you talking about Willis moments, all right? What are you talking about? You have to look that up on YouTube. Different strokes. All right. Verse 29. Paul answers. But a Jew is one inwardly. They're still not getting it. And circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit. Not by the letter. His praise is not from man. But from God. So you see. There is the description by Paul in Romans 2, 28, 29 of the circumcision of the heart. That physical outward symbol, that circumcision process pointed to one's whole life commitment to the living God. And it also pointed to that inner spiritual reality of a circumcision of the heart. Listen, which can only be done. No human surgeon's scalpel can go deep enough into your heart. In fact, as my wife reminded me the other day, I mine has been taken out of my chest and stopped and worked on. And even those doctors cannot do what's being talked about right here. They cannot. It is only God in His grace. And in His mercy, through the work of the Holy Spirit in you, that will circumcise your heart, change your heart to be a heart of flesh rather than a heart of stone. That's what you see here. So, God reveals Himself. That's number one. Abram been waiting 24 years. He's now 99 years old. And God reveals himself, and then God declares his covenant to him and gives him the sign of the covenant, circumcision. That leads us to point number three. You're doing well here on time. Number three. God guarantees the promised seed. God guarantees the promised seed. Look in chapter 17. Go back to Genesis. Chapter 17. 
Now look in verse 15. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, not Hagar here, I will bless her, Sarah, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, that's Sarah, and she, that's Sarah, shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. So, you'll notice in 1516, Sarai is renamed Sarah. Now, both Sarai and Sarah mean princess. That's what, but, but, but there's a change in the spelling. And what, what he's doing here, he's showing, hey, the sovereign Lord is sovereign over Abram to Abraham. He's also sovereign Lord of Sarai to Sarah. But you know what princess, you know what princesses give birth to? Kings. Kings. Princesses have kings. And look in verse 17. Then Abram fell on his face again. And this time he laughed. And he said to himself, and, and this is never in any of the commentaries, and, and more important than the commentaries, it's, it's, it's not in the text that God was angry at Abram, Abraham for laughing. It, it, there's no mention here of God being Upset about Abraham laughing. So God knew Abram's, Abraham's heart. So he fell on his face and he laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who's a hundred years old? He's like, really? Really? Shall Sarah, who's like 90 years God, she's 90 years old. Are you kidding me? And so Abraham, verse 18, said to God, here he's trying to help God again. We've been down this road, Lord. I have a son. And Sarah can adopt him if she wants to, and she can be, he can be our son. So Abraham says to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Verse 19, God said, what's that next word? No. But... Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, that's Isaac, as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And so what we see here is, listen to me, Ishmael, the son of the flesh, is not the promised seed. See, God's reminding Abraham again that Sarah will bear him a son, and God will establish an everlasting covenant with Isaac. And by the way, Isaac's name means laughter. All right? So Isaac, then, is in the line of the promised seed. You have to understand this. Isaac is in the line of the promised seed. If you remember back when we were studying in Genesis 3.15, where, you know, the Lord comes and he speaks to the serpent. And he says, you know, I'm going to put enmity between you and between the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he's going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. That's Genesis 3.15. And so then that line, the line of the promised seed, we're looking for it. And listen, as we studied through Genesis, we've seen it. The line of the promised seed. Uh, Adam and Eve then conceived after, after uh, Cain slew Abel. Then Adam and Eve conceived again, and, and they had many children, but the ones named are Adam, Abel and Cain and then Seth, many other nameless children. But, but then that promised seed would have been Seth. And then from Seth, you go four generations, you have a man whose name is Noah. And then you have a, one of the sons of Noah whose name is Shem. And then from Shem, you have a, a man who uh, gives birth to a man named Abram. Down the line. And Abram becomes Abraham, and Abraham gives birth to Isaac. And Isaac and his wife gives birth to Esau and Jacob, right? And as Brother Shelobo was teaching our children this morning, which one is smooth skin? Esau. Which one's the older? Esau. But you know, I just wrote this lesson for the Alabama Baptist coming up December 2nd. It's going to be some of y'all's community group lesson coming up uh 
The younger shall serve. No, it's the older shall serve the younger. God, by his sovereignty, is changing the normal flow of things there. And so you have that promised seed from, 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 from Noah, right, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, to David, to Jesus. That's what we see happening here in this promise. So Isaac, then the son of Abraham and Sarah, is going to be in the line of the promised seed. And listen to me. Kings did actually come out of Abraham and Sarah. They gave birth to kings, just like God said. That shouldn't surprise us, but that's exactly what happened. And we're going to put some scriptures up on the screen to help us think through this quickly. I want you to see the the biblical theology of this principle here, all right? Uh, Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. We're going to put that up on the screen. Look at it. Let's, let's read. Let me read it for you. Just follow along with me. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, right? Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Genesis 49 10 is telling you and me that there's going to be one who will be king from the tribe of Judah. All right? The next scripture is 2 Samuel 7:16. 7, 2 Samuel 16. Here the Lord is speaking to King David. Okay? Now, you got to realize Abraham is around 2000 BC. David is around 1000 BC. Okay? You go another thousand years, you got Jesus being born. All right? So, see, Jesus is 2000 years from the time of Abraham. But notice 2 Samuel 7 16. The Lord, that's Yahweh again, speaking now to David in the Davidic covenant, and your house. And your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's 2 Samuel 7, 16. Now, Ezekiel 34, 23. Look at Ezekiel 34, 23. And I will set up over them one shepherd, one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Ezekiel 34, 23. Look at Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. We are rolling toward Christmas, and this may jog some Christmas memories. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall, what, be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of, now check out 7. We know 9, 6, but check out 9, 7, Isaiah 9, 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Look at Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a what? On a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then look at Matthew 21, 9. Palm Sunday. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do you see the biblical theology? The promised seed is in Jesus Christ. I want you to flip. You you can leave Genesis 17. Because we're getting ready to land the plane. But I want you to go to Galatians. Galatians with me. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. I want you to see this. This, We've been talking about God guarantees the promised seed. That's point number 3. God guarantees the promised seed. Look who the Holy Spirit led Paul to identify as the promised seed or offspring. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Check it out. Galatians 3. Gentiles eat pork chops. You got it? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. Works equally well, right? 
Genesis 3, uh, Galatians 3, 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Now check this out. This is Holy Spirit interpretation of the Bible here. Okay? Can't be wrong. All right? It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring. Literally, it's the word seed there. To your seed, singular. Notice that what Paul says, who is whom? Christ. Who is Christ? Galatians 3.16. The promised seed is ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go to the right. From Galatians, go to Ephesians, Philippians, go to Colossians. The passage that I used when we had prayer a few moments ago. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. I want you to see these verses. We prayed these verses earlier in the worship gathering. I want you to see them now. Black ink on white paper. Are you with me? Colossians 2, 9 through 14. For in Him, that's Christ. Remember, in Christ, Galatians 3, 16 is the promised seed. He's He's the promised Son. The children in the opening, straight out of Bethlehem. Amen? It's going to be an awesome Christ-centered musical coming up Sunday night, December the 2nd, 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Christ-centered Christmas worship. Imagine that. That's the way it ought to be. But in Him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity, that means Godhood, dwells bodily. That's in that God-man Jesus. Amen? And you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. That's important. That's worthy of a sermon. We don't have time today. Verse 11. In Him, that's in Christ, you were... Now, what's that word? Remember, you're in church. You can say it, all right? It's okay. In Him, in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without what? So it's not the physical circumcision here. It's a spiritual one. Listen to that. By putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Amen? We've been singing about that all morning. Verse 13. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together, hallelujah, with him, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Listen to me. There was pain and there was blood on Good Friday as Jesus was nailed to the cross. And the new covenant was initiated. Jesus underwent the ultimate circumcision, if you will, so that we might receive the ultimate circumcision of the heart, Romans 2.29. To put it another way, Jesus' body was cut away from the land of the living because of our sin. Jesus was cut off from God for our sin. And in Matthew 27, verse 46, on the cross, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible said that for every one who is not circumcised, they're to be cut off from their people. Jesus willingly was cut off out of the land of the living. And even that eternal relationship with Father God was severed in a moment of time as he redeemed a people for his Father. You see, Genesis chapter 17 shows us how God is at work. Saving a people for himself. And this morning, these scriptures point us to the gospel. Good news. Yes, there was blood. And yes, there was pain. In fact, our word excruciating literally means out of the cross. That's what it means. 
Excruciating means out of the cross. Out of the cross. That excruciating headache you have. That excruciating assignment at school you have. That excruciating relationship you're going through or coming out of or whatever. The word excruciating means literally out of the cross. So there was blood, there was blood, there was pain, there was suffering, there was death, there was spiritual agony in Christ as he bore the wrath of God for us that we might be forgiven, saved, adopted into the family of God. You see, truly, God's covenant with Abraham has lasting benefits for all the peoples of the world including you and me. And so if you're here this morning, and you are, (laughs) but you're not a believer, I want you to hear God, who is holy, righteous, and merciful. He's our God. He's our creator. We are accountable to him. We are responsible to Him. He's just. But He is merciful. He's gracious and forgiving. If we will come to Him on His terms. And you see, Jesus, the promised seed of Abraham, says that if you do not honor the Father, then you do not, if you do not honor the Son, then you do not honor the Father. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus says, if you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father. It is the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 5, who wrote, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. It is Dr. Luke who wrote in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Christ is that name. And this morning, if the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you of sin and and, and you feel being drawn to God, if you sense that, that you're coming alive to God and dying to sin, let me encourage you in just a moment. We're going to sing what we call a response song. And Pastor Glad and I will be here. And we have other men that can also help counsel. But if you, if you want to pray with one of us or talk with one of us, you can come as we sing our response song in just a moment. And we'll be happy to have one of our younger brothers go out with you, one of our deacons or someone go out and even just explain the gospel to you. If you have a question, you can respond. If you have a need, you can respond. If you want to be saved, you can trust in Christ. Just call. For everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. You see, the Bible teaches this truth, that the gospel is the good news, that the just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people, and he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear his wrath against sin and to show his power over sin by resurrecting Jesus' dead body from the grave so that everyone who turns from their sin and believes in him will be reconciled to God forever. That is salvation. That is spiritual circumcision of the heart. Has that happened to you? Today can be your day. Let's pray together.